Okay, hello, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this, this webinar today. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I am happy to, to moderate today's webinar, uh, which is an RFF CMCC Navigate webinar. Um, uh, my name is Johannes Emmerling. I'm a researcher at the RFF CMCC, uh, European Institute on Economics and the Environment in Milan. And today we're going to uh, have a presentation by Nico Bauer from uh, the Potsdam Institute on Climate Impact Research in, in Potsdam. And we also have a discussion, uh, discussion by Ulrike Korneck from Kiel University on, on a similar topic. Um, the, the title of the presentation or, or the, the, the webinar is, is, uh, is the topic is the efficiency sovereignty trade-off in climate policy, a quantification approach. Um, and I will, I will go to it, to it in a minute. Let me just briefly um, state that well, this webinar is co-organized by, by us, RFF CMCC, and it's jointly organized with this European Horizon 2020 project, uh, Navigate which is a project running uh, until 2023 on developing the next generation of uh, integrated assessment models. It's a pan-European and, and even global project with partners from, from uh, most countries in Europe, including some international partners, focusing on how um, <clears throat> the systems uh, have to be transformed in order to, for climate policy to be effectively implemented, looking at transformative change, um, transformation of, of goods and services, of energy demand. And it also looks at the people dimension, at uh, social heterogeneity, inequality, impacts of climate change and co-benefits and links with other SDGs. And I think this, uh, this webinar today speaks kind of to both uh, topics, to, to climate policies um, and what, what they imply, and also to the dimension of, let's say, um, a national policy perspective, how different uh, the spatial, especially spatial heterogeneity of countries and, and regions matter. Um, as you know, this is, a, this is a webinar, so we have the standard, let's say, Q&A uh, features that we will use at the, after the presentation and the discussion. And you have two options. Uh, you can all raise your hand, in which case I will give you the floor so you can ask your, your question uh, via voce. Or um, the Q&A section is also available to, to, to post comments and questions to the speaker that I will then read out to, to the speaker and discuss it. Um, just, just a note that this uh, webinar will be will be recorded and it will be uploaded afterwards on the CMCC and also the Navigate websites, YouTube channels. If you have any other questions, please uh, you can you can send us an email. Here you also find the, the website of of Navigate the project and and ourselves if you want further information. And finally, uh, it's already for uh, February 25th, the next webinar, which is a CMCC webinar, uh, where the topic is data learning, a combination of, of uh, data assimilation and machine learning. So we cover, cover a wide uh, range of topics in general. And um, yeah, so feel free to, to join every time you want uh, on these webinars. But without further ado, now let's uh, move to today's speaker. And I'm happy that Nico Bauer from PIC has accepted the, the invitation to talk about um, his, his paper and, and works on the efficiency and sovereignty at uh, PIC in Potsdam and also co-leading one of the integrated assessment models uh, that is developed there. Remind and yeah, without further ado, uh, Nico, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen. Um, you have around, let's say, 30, 35 minutes, and um, then we have the discussion by Ulrike Korneck and, and time for questions and answers. Um, so I think I can see the screen coming up. So thanks again for listening, everyone, and we talk to you in after the presentations. Yeah, thank you very much, Johannes, and uh, thanks, Ulrike, for reading the paper and discussing it also. So... Um, Corona times is Zoom time, so I, ho I hope that my voice is uh, properly transmitted. So um, this is a paper that is already published, and the title is Quantifying an Efficiency Sovereignty Trade-Off 
in climate policies. I put international in parentheses because that was the word I would have liked to edit if the editors would have allowed it, because we are talking here about uh, international climate policies and how to achieve, to achieve this uh, in an efficient, but also an equal uh, manner that respects the sovereignty. And the basic question that we have is how to achieve the well below two, de two degree target with equitable effort sharing. This means that we want to avoid regressive economic effects across economies. So climate policies has a tendency to increase the and deepen the existing inequalities. And we want to neutralize this effect. We do not want to deepen the uh, existing inequalities. The sovereignty in this study uh, means that we limit international transfer payments. So the, um, uh, the uh, governing of national economic resources. It is not interpreted as avoiding mitigation policies, but rather to free ride. This is not what is meant here. Um, the discussions after the publication of this paper uh, also led me to the idea uh, that achieving stringent targets unilaterally without international offset mechanisms, so no Article 6 uh, Paris Agreement uh, deals, uh, this is very similar to the sovereignty concept that we apply here, because the transfer also has something to do with implementing um, international flexibility mechanisms. So we at PIC also do other research in inequality and um, international climate policies. So for example, the efficiency gains uh, from integrating fragmented NDC policies. We also uh, think about uh, the need to strengthen the NDCs because they're so far, as everybody knows, not compatible with the long-term targets. We also look into intranational distribution and poverty eradication, so the SDG1 dimension. Um, and there's a paper by Bjorn Sergel that is accepted, so the R should be a T. Um, we uh, analyze also the CDR, overshoot flexibility, and the distribution issues with mitigation costs in this context. So all that is ongoing work um, about which I will not talk here, but uh, we are also interested in this with our REMIND model. Um, and then we also have the climate change impact uh, with distributional issues in ongoing um, projects like the Navigate project that uh, Johannes mentioned. So the heterogeneity that uh, was also highlighted. So across the globe, we have very, very deep uh, inequalities in economic income. So this is uh, income per capita in uh, market exchange rates. And you can see the OECD leads uh, the other major world regions by a lot. At the same time, uh, we have relatively high CO2 emissions per capita. Although um, in absolute terms, the Asian uh, CO2 emissions already exceed the OECD CO2 emissions. Um, the carbon productivity, so basically the inverse of the carbon intensity, uh, is high in the OECD countries. So um, it is possible to the OECD countries produce a lot of economic value from a ton of CO2 emitted, whereas uh, especially the Asian, uh, Middle East, Africa, and also the reforming economies are very uh, low in this indicator. The same basically also holds for energy productivity. And this means that the OECD countries are less dependent on energy and the use of carbon in their economies. And also the share of income that is devoted to um, energy services uh, is lower than in uh, non-OECD countries. So emission mitigation policies have a different effect. Um, the climate change problem is a global common goods problem. Each ton of CO2 is basically equal because of the mixing in the atmosphere. 
Um, but international agreements require an, um, consent by sovereign nation states. And uh, Bill Nordhaus went so far to call this the Westphalian problem uh, of sovereign nation states. And here he refers to the 1648 um, peace treaty that ended the uh, war in Central Europe at that time. So I must say, if you look a little deeper, it's a flawed comparison, but okay, it makes clear what the scale of the, um, the problem is. Um, nation states and international agreements in a world of inequality. So in uh, many of our uh, integrated assessment modeling exercises to look for mitigation targets like the two degree target, uh, we usually do not so much look into the effort sharing. Uh, we usually uh, assume a uniform carbon price without any transfers. And we know that this has uh, regressive policy effects. So first, the emission reductions here in 2014, F40, uh, um, would be somewhat more relaxed in the OECD countries. It would be stronger emission reductions in the Asian countries. Um, also, um, uh, in the the Latin American countries and the reforming economies in particular have very huge uh, spread of uh, the emission reduction efforts in 2040. What is more important now is that with the uniform carbon prices, the OECD has lower emission reduction costs than Asia. So if they would all be on the 100 line, they would all, all be equal. Uh, but um, the OECD usually has lower costs. Um, when we look into effort sharing, then um, we usually assume a cap and trade system that implies a uniform carbon price and a cost efficient uh, policy solution to the emission reduction requirements. With, permit, with targeted permit allocations, we could um, neutralize the regressive effects uh, to some degree. Um, so this inverse, inverse approach of equal effort sharing uh, implies that we have huge transfers via permit trade to neutralize uh, in unequal uh, mitigation costs. Uh, but the efficiency um, uh, of the transformation pathway is not affected by this redistribution. What is uh, difficult uh, in the game here is that emissions of one party is not emissions of another party. So if uh, the European Union uh, would uh, be demanded to agree on a uh, per capita, distribution, they would receive less permits and Africa would receive more permits. So that's a typical cake eating problem kind of. Um, in this study, uh, we have an emission target, a carbon budget, and we want to achieve the uh, equal effort sharing criterion. Oops, sorry. Um, we do so by either differentiating the carbon price or vary transfers. So two instruments to achieve the two targets. Um, the cost efficiency is not necessarily maintained and the transition pathways can change because we allow for this differentiation of the carbon prices rather than maintaining a uniform carbon price. So methodology of the integrated assessment model, we use the Remind Magpie model and uh, Remind is an economy energy model, whereas Magpie is a uh, land use model. And uh, here we will also show that this uh, um, equity issue and the differentiation of the carbon prices has a huge impact on the land use as well. Yeah, not only the energy, but also the land use. Uh, we have 12 regions. We trade in goods, uh, macroeconomic goods, basically, energy and food. 
We uh, account for all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, and their sources. We use the SSP2 uh, assumptions as major drivers. We also do some um, um, some a sensitivity analysis with these assumptions, but uh, here I will only refer to the standard SSP2 case. Um, we take our NDC policies until 2020 and only start with the carbon taxes after uh, in 2025, and they grow at uh, two per, uh, at five percent per annum. The total carbon budget is 1300 gigatons of CO2. And the effort indicator that uh, we want to maintain is the equal relative income loss. And this is a net present value discounted at 5% per year. And this is, so to say, to avoid regressive income effects, not to deepen inequality. So the results. At first, we start with very um, uh, uh, extreme points, corner solutions of a trilemma. So uh, when we implement uniform carbon prices, we would achieve something like uh, $60 per ton of CO2. This is a log scale here. Um, and this would lead to income losses for the different regions. Um, and they are distributed rather inequally when you look at uh, the fact that the European Union would have a, um, a loss of about is, um, 0.3%, whereas uh, India would have 3% income loss. So that is... Uh, definitely not in line with uh, the fairness uh, requirement. So if we allow for transfers to neutralize this regressive income effect, uh, you could see that naturally, so the costs, the income loss for uh, the OECD countries in blue would definitely increase. Those of the non-OECD would in exchange decrease. The costs are the same, yeah, the total global. It's no difference. So if we now differentiate, so we want to achieve the same relative income losses, but not via transfers, but, but via differentiating the carbon prices, we would see that the OECD countries would have very high carbon prices, whereas the non-OECD countries uh, um, would need to impose only smaller ones. However, this is an inefficient solution and the total costs increase. So these are the corner solutions. Now, we could have stopped at that point, could have said, oh, this is a very interesting result, huge sensitivity, um, and um, we would have two opposing positions or three opposing positions on how to tackle the problems. However, we thought, if there is such a huge effect, then we have to look into uh, what is going on in between. So we have here, again, the, um, the, the point um, of uniform taxes without transfers. This is the mitigation cost that you saw, the global. And here we have the intra-regional transfers across regions. So, this is, so to say, the maintaining the efficient solution, but doing a lot of transfers, or we differentiate the carbon prices. And it has an effect on the distribution of the emissions. I will show you this later, but now first look at this uh, figure. And what we did is we used the differentiated carbon prices of this extreme case, then used a compression function written down here, and we vary this exponent alpha, yeah? And uh, with this, we can uh, vary between the uniform case, alpha equals zero, and alpha equal one is just, again, the same bump price in the, uh, as in the full differentiation case, yeah? And so for Europe, we would start here, and then use this function and end up here. 
So these set, this set of carbon prices with the growth pattern that we prescribe would lead to a failure of the uh, current budget. Then we readjust this set of carbon prices to again establish, uh, to again achieve the carbon budget. And then we have mitigation costs, global mitigation costs. And we can compute then also the residual transfers required to again achieve the equal effort criteria. So basically what we do is we explore the space from this point uh, from this point here up to this point here. And the question is, what is the shape looking like? And that was um, the question we were very uh, excited to find out um, when we designed the study. And the point is, so if we start here at the uniform comprises uh, with transfers, then we see that slightly differentiating uh, the carbon prices leads to a huge reduction of the transfers. So the, the slope levels off and we can see that uh, from this point here, um, adding a little transfers would reduce the costs enormously and also reduce the, um, the spread of the carbon price. Yeah, and this nonlinear function uh, made us think a lot what, uh, what is happening here. Um, and we will wanted also to see what is happening to the emissions because with differentiated comprises, we have different uh, emission patterns. And we see that the OECD is allowed to use more of the um, uh, fossil fuels and emit CO2 from fossil fuels. Um, the OECD in turn would um, emit less and do more um, bioenergy with uh, CCS. Yeah, this is this light blue one here. This, incre um, this imbalance increases as we differentiate more and more the uh, carbon prices. Yeah? We have here ever more bags, also more uh, forestation in the OECD. The non-OECD decreases afforestation. It also decreases the bioenergy with CCS. And also um, you can see that the non-OECD would do more deforestation because the non-OECD would plant more bioenergy to export it to the OECD. Yeah? And the OECD would then turn this into uh, bioenergy with CCS. So this is the highly distorted markets and um, the result of the differentiated carbon prices. You could even see that the OECD would turn net negative here with the total emissions. What is also interesting, so for small uh, variations, we see the largest uh, changes in um, the emission uh, reallocation. Yeah? When we are here at very high um, or very strong differentiations, uh, then there is not happening so much anymore. Yeah? There's a little uh, DAC coming in, but um, when the carbon price spreads get here into the region of uh, 100, then uh, the, the problem uh, becomes only one of increasing the cost of the OECD and decreasing it um, for the, for the non-OECD, but the emission effort, the emission mitigation action would not change that much anymore. Okay. What is happening here? Basically, we could have two countries, uh, one and two, so the blue and the orange one. And what we have in the uniform tax case is um, two different emission mitigation levels. Yeah? And now the one country reduces less 
and would have um, uh, lower uh, mitigation costs, whereas the other country would need to do more and they would have very different um, comp prices. Now, with uh, a Harberger uh, kind of distributional analysis, the mitigation costs in the one country would decrease and the other um, decrease in the one and increase in the other. So this makes um, the transfer obsolete to achieve a distributional target as we formulated it. Now, there's lower total mitigation costs in the uh, one country and somewhat higher in the other. The difference between the two is the additional mitigation cost. So, oops, um, this is the reason why you see this very steep decrease of uh, the um, uh, uh, of the transfers with only small additional midi global mitigation costs. So now results on the timing of mitigation. Uh, we identified several indicators that um, different uh, the OECD and the non-OECD would achieve at different points in time. This is the uh, x-axis that you see here. Yeah. Now we can ask the question, when do the different regions achieve these, um, these uh, indicators? So I would like you to have uh, some uh, uh, con um, concentration on this. Total CO2 emissions turn negative, so the carbon neutrality indicator basically. And with this carbon budget, that would be around 2070 uh, in the OECD. And it would be um, slightly after 2070 uh, for the non OECD. For this carbon budget, which is not a 1.5, it is a two degree carbon budget. Yeah? So our, all the indicators are roughly the same for OECD and non-OECD. If we have completely differentiated common prices, however, the OECD would need to do much more and do much earlier. So here, the common neutrality would be achieved in the OECD prior to 2040, whereas it is not even achieved before 2100 in the non-OECD countries. So this timing issue here is really important. Um, with full differentiation in the OECD, everything has to happen earlier and tighter. So that, not a real succession, but everything at once. Whereas for the non-OECD, the transition would be later and stretch over a longer time. So we have to accept that inequality is a crucial point for international climate policies. There's this trilemma of costs, equity, and sovereignty. The corner solutions lead us to very excessive outcomes. So uh, the cost efficient solution without transfers leads to mitigation costs who vary by a factor of 10. With transfers, we would have huge transfers. In the fully differentiated case, the common prices would differ by more than a factor of 100. However, if we um, start from uh, the full um, differentiation case, so you have all the different countries basically submitting their common neutrality pledges, kind of, and now some countries have very high mitigation costs, others have much uh, lower and at high CO2 prices and the others have uh, lower CO2 prices. Uh, you may start to negotiate some deals uh, to decrease uh, the costs for all. And only small changes or small offset mechanisms would reduce the mitigation costs globally by a substantial amount. 
The market distortions could be reduced, also the higher CDR could be reduced. We would have uh, transitions that are more synchronous. For example, when do the countries achieve carbon neutrality? And the technology roadmaps would be synchronized. What I have not addressed here, uh, it is in the publication that additional sector policies uh, can help to reduce the inefficiencies uh, and uh, the additional market distortions. So last slide, future research. Um, we can have different metrics um, and that could also in, uh, incorporate uh, the treatment of pre-existing taxes yeah, and uh, fuel taxes, electricity taxes like that. We could also include damages and adaptation, uh, which has been a major focus, for example, by uh, Jeffrey Hill and Graziella Cicciolniski, and I think Willi is going to talk a little about that in a second. An important question is, hey, how do we get on this trade-off curve? Yeah, we, we basically assumed in this study, hey, we are on the trade-off curve, and now we, we, how can we uh, move up and down, what are the effects if we move up and down? But how to get there in political negotiations? This is a very difficult problem because, so to say, the in, a, in, a, in an analogous sense, uh, the, um, uh, the private property rights are not defined. So the emission reduction requirements are not, requi uh, are not defined, just the precondition to be on the curve. Currently, we are off the curve. How do we get there? Could be conditional mitigation commitments, could ask for climate clubs, uh, could have uh, internal tax harmonization and external tariffs. So the uh, Nordhaus uh, proposal basically. Um, and one may also ask on how, how can we shift the uh, feasibility frontier? So if we say we are now on a on a, on a non parous uh, consistent, compatible uh, frontier, how can we collectively move this frontier? Uh, additionally, we may think, uh, what are substitutes to transfers? Transfers is something that is very liquid, yeah? It's money, yeah? You can do everything out of it. But also nation states, usually do not like to give away money from their uh, public budgets, basically. So one may ask, uh, can we do something else but transfers? For example, technology development and technology transfers or uh, adaptation assistance, debt relief may be something which is uh, nearly uh, liquid money. Or we could think about issue linkages with SDGs um, to, for more open trade and um, other things uh, that might be possible. So thank you very much for your attention. That was it. And I managed to do it in less than half an hour. So we have plenty of time for discussions. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, very good timing. Thanks, Nico, a lot for an uh, uh, interesting uh, presentation on a, a very important topic. And uh, so, yeah, let's move directly to Ulrike Korneck from Kiel University, who works on very uh, related topics. So I think, yeah, it would be interesting to uh, her take on, on the top topic at stake. Yeah, thanks, Johannes, and thanks, Nico, um, for the uh, interesting talk and the invitation to discuss this. So here are my highlights. Let's say I'm not going to talk about the technology stuff because I guess that's <laughs> less interesting to me. Um, so you um, establish here that the equal effort is um, um, a benchmark for cooperation uh, under the Paris Agreement. And that uh, uh, you find here that then using a uniform carbon price without transfers means that the efforts are not equalized. And here effort um, are um, defined or is defined as uh, mitigation cost to income ratio. Um, then you've just shown here impressively international transfers can do something against that or you use 
differentiated carbon prices to equalize the efforts. And then you allude here to this difficulty that the international transfers interfere with sovereignty, but the differentiated carbon prices really increase overall mitigation costs and um, increase them heterogeneously uh, here also due to um, leakage um, effects um, that you didn't go into quite detail here today. Um, and then you uh, um, give insight here into your findings that due to the convex marginal abatement cost curves, uh, we can moderately differentiate carbon price uh, at, at low costs or uh, uh, use low, low, much lower international transfers to, to uh, equalize the efforts. I want to share a couple of thoughts um, on this and maybe the for me, at least, reading the paper, the elephant in the room was uh, social welfare. And um, here, the uh, criterion of the equal effort um, is something that, that might be more uh, you um, or applicable in the context of free writing, which you ruled out as the context you, you, you're thinking about. But And then uh, the question is here, how the equal effort uh, criterion relates to global cooperation in terms of aggregate welfare. And I think it would be super interesting um, for, for Remind to evaluate these policy scenarios that you're talking about here with different um, social welfare functions um, that may rank um, the, the different outcomes. Um, and then you show here that um, you have um, different welfare levels and different scenarios for, for these countries. And here, uh, figure 2B highlights then some regions will lose and others gain under these um, differentiated um, scenarios. Um, but it's, it's really hard to know uh, which one is preferred by whom, uh, let's say, um, and, and, and especially in terms of aggregate welfare. So this would be super interesting here um, to explore maybe, maybe in the future and maybe in the Navigate project uh, where we're thinking about these issues. And the uh, second um, thought I wanna add here is the efficiency um, definition. So you basically say that efficiency here is least global costs the way that aggregate global costs the way that you define it but if you if if you're thinking about different regions and how their effort compares to one another then efficiency might not be about the aggregate global output but um there's and you just said it uh to Chinesky and heels paper he shows that if transfers are limited then um or you have transfers available, this gives a really different um, allocation along the Pareto efficient frontier where Pareto efficiency here means you can't make anybody worse off without, uh, uh, better off without making others worse off. And um, here, this would be also good to um, discuss maybe in the future, if you have these limited transfers available, what is the uh, um, a Pareto efficient frontier here, the trade-off between carbon prices and these limited transfers. Um, and then you uh, said a little bit more detail here, so I added actually another point. My question would be the, how is the equal effort defined? And how does this then relate to um, uh, your outcome here? So you said it's the discounted at 5% um, constant discount rate, uh, relative income loss. Um, is income here GDP? Is this the appropriate measure? Or when we think about welfare of countries and effort, wouldn't consumption be the better measure for the burden across uh, regions? And then important here how intergenerational inequality is dealt with. So if you're fixing the interest rate at 5% that you're discounting future value, but in the allocation between different carbon prices, you change how uh, income is distributed over time, then this might change your evaluation of, of the different policies. So that would be great if you could comment here a little bit on, on this. And last but not least on the social welfare, because I'm thinking about that a lot. Um, you already said would be great to take the benefit uh, side into account. I totally agree on that. And here, um, thinking about 
subnational inequality would be important, I, I, I think, and this is something you guys are working on um, and really um, talking about equal effort also on the household level with damages. And here's a, a, a picture or graph from a, uh, a work of mine where we think about these um, efficient carbon prices uh, when we have household heterogeneity and how, how um, costs and damages are distributed across household and how that, that then influences uh, um, optimal climate policy. And then last but not least, so that one subject area here is social welfare. The other one is transfers. Thanks for citing my paper here um, in the context of um, free riding incentives. And here we establish this idea in, in this paper that equalizing um, efforts across countries is a way to move towards cooperation by using these transfers in a strategic way, which means that um, you are making them conditional on um, the carbon price that's being implemented. And this is just food for thought here for me. Um, we in this paper here have the benefit side um, taken into account, but um, I'm puzzled by how to incorporate this in two degree scenario. So uh, your paper really got me thinking here of an extension of this uh, uh, approach that, that you're citing, um, how to combine this with, with uh, temperature targets rather than um, benefits of, of mitigation. So thank you for that. And yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Ulrike, also for this uh, very, very on point uh, discussion. And uh, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know, Nico, if you have some comments, maybe reactions to uh, all of these, actually quite a few points raised. So Sorry, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I realized yeah. talking that this is longer than I anticipated. <laughs> So I managed, I managed to keep in time with the presentation, but I, I have doubts that I can manage to be in time with the discussion. No? Um, within the paper, we looked at consumption differences as an indicator also. The in, in, income is, so to say, yeah, the GDP, but corrected by um, the uh, rent incomes from uh, energy trade and uh, food trade. Yeah. So it, it's not GDP equals income. It, we, we consider these rent income differences also. Uh, when you take consumption, uh, the, the whole picture changes, and the, uh, uh, the, the impact on um, fossil fuel exporting countries gets larger. Yeah, the ranking changes considerably, and you get a tougher, um, uh, very uh, tougher uh, uh, differentiations between OECD countries and oil exporting countries. Yeah? Because when you look into GDP and mm -hmm. um, the consumption differences, they are larger uh, for, the, uh, um, for the fossil fuel exporting countries. That, that's a major effect here. Uh, one could also look into welfare, which would go even a step further. And if you would uh, look into, so also kind of taken into account welfare weighting, which is directly related, as we know from the Nikishi approach, uh, then the, the, the pressure due to the economic inequality would even further increase. Yeah? So if you take the marginal utility of consumption, basically. Um, that would only lead, in my opinion, to either larger transfers or even more uh, uh, differentiated carbon prices. But what would that mean? Yeah, what would that mean? It would mean that you basically try to solve the inequality problem by climate policy. And then the question is whether this is a good idea. A big question. <laughs> yeah, but this is important. Do we want to mix 
addressing global inequality po uh, by climate policies. And, and that's a big thing. So uh, um, we also, we did not look into the, uh, the, um, the um, discount rate with which we compute the net present value of these income losses. But um, with a lower discount rate, we would increase uh, the distributional burden or the, the distributional uh, problem. Uh, we looked into what would be a shorter, so this is what we looked explicitly in now, uh, we uh, shortened um, the metric, uh, the, the time horizon of the metric from 2100 to only 2050, yeah? And that led to much uh, smaller price differentiations and smaller uh, uh, transfers, yeah? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, yeah, uh, that's so, so far. Johannes, you want to open the discussion? I... Yeah, 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 I think. Thank I think you, Diko. I think many but points were actually like... quite related to also points that have been already raised. So let's maybe move the discussion open it also that we can still come back to these issues also. Um, yeah, let me start with a few of the questions that have been asked already. Um, one from uh, Emanuele Burmis. Did you consider, like, uh, there was this famous uh, proposition in, I think, uh, Wall Street Journal or something about this carbon free and dividend, carbon dividend approach to, to um, signed by many, many economists, um, how to give back, let's say, some of the carbon, carbon um, uh, price, price uh, returns to, to, to improve the support of climate policies of the CL Council, um, right? The economist status on carbon dividends. I don't know if you looked into that, but it might be relevant for that. But it's probably more than uh, and a comment. Um, more of a question is, is, did you look at all, you mentioned at the very end, into sustainable solutions uh, or, or SDG relation, uh, other SDG dimensions in this paper or, or not? I mean, that was one question. And maybe, yeah, maybe it combine it just with another one, so you can maybe take notes. Um, from uh, Michel de Nelson, is how did you calculate your differential carbon prices? I mean, you, you showed uh, basically uh, the approach more or less, but of course, um, um, yeah, it's a bit difficult to reproduce, especially also for policymakers. Um, and and so I was wondering how would these rule compare to some, let's say, simple allocation rules that have been discussed in this burden sharing uh, literature, maybe like uh, equal equal per capita per capita contraction convergence rules, if they can compare to those. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe you can take those two questions while. Yeah. So thanks a lot. Uh, I do not know the particular proposal uh, mentioned here. Um, so I think what, what the approach showed with the differentiated carbon prices is that additional policies, um, energy sector policies, land use policies, technology transfer policies get a different role than in, uh, when you take the uniform carbon pricing as the starting point. Uh, we even found for the uh, differentiated carbon price case that the um, carbon leakage by the bioenergy channel, so non-OECD countries, plant trees, cut down trees to grow bioenergy that is exported to the OECD. This, it, this is an absurd effect that is happening. And if we ban bioenergy trade, in a case of differentiated carbon pricing, we can even improve welfare. In a case of uniform carbon pricing, this is not the case. So this is one of the sensitivity analysis that we have done, and that is uh, uh, part of the um, extended data uh, to the paper. Um, the SDGs, uh, the, the SDGs, we have not looked into more SDGs here, uh, there is other papers on also differentiated comp pricing and SDGs that are in the process of, um, of uh, reviews. No, um, okay. but, but here, um, I mean, 
we would have liked to look into, but uh, space is limited. Uh, Michelle Del Den Elson's uh, question. So basically, it, it's a rather, it's a surprisingly simple search algorithm. So what we basically do is we impose the constraint that um, we, we let the model run, we compute the relative income losses and all, and compare it to the global uh, uh, average. Then for all the countries with excess uh, or higher, um, uh, um, higher mitigation costs, we reduce the carbon price and for all with a lower uh, mitigation costs, we increase it. We have the ratios of the carbon prices fixed and then move collectively up and down up until the point we again meet the common budget. Sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, it's rather simple, to be honest. And it worked relatively well. Uh, it takes some time, sure, but um, that's the computer's problem, so to say. Um, yeah, and um, th th this is not the problem uh, to compute for this criteria, yeah, because we have a relative income loss. And the problem now with other criterions like equal, uh, um, the equal per capita permission uh, allocation, uh, permit allocation. This is something different because there you look into the input side of your um, allocation within a cap and trade system. But that is difficult to translate into something for differentiated carbon prices. With, uh, when we differentiate the carbon prices, the relative income loss globally goes up and down. But now it is difficult to find something similar for an algorithm to implement when you uh, use something like the equal uh, per capita uh, uh, permit allocation. Okay, yeah. No, I think it makes sense, thanks. Um, there are two more questions uh, in, in one direction, which I think is, is also interesting. It's about more the regional results, like the uh, Rafael Garafa is asking about the direction of trade, so which uh, the transfers across regions, um, because of course there are some, they are quite quite huge as you showed and uh, might of course uh, reach some kind of uh, feasibilities in, in terms of uh, uh, the public budget and these kind of things. And a related question by uh, Fyodor Bekele is about especially developing countries uh, like, let's say, you mentioned China, but also sub-Saharan African countries, which have, of course, a, a big focus on, on, on national sovereignty and, and poverty reduction, um, but at the same time trying to 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 do agreement, etc. Yeah, just saying that, well, this is... a uh, yeah, just some comment on these uh, big challenges, especially from a developing country perspective also. Okay, uh, so is it overstretching the public budgets with the transfers? Uh, definitely not. The global mitigation cost is 1.2%, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 1.2. And for Europe, for example, it's 0.3% um, in the uniform compressing case. So the transfer is then 0.9%. So this is not uh, overstretching, so to say, the economic abilities. Um, differently, you may ask, okay, these 3% for India, that might be a bigger problem for them. Um, yeah, now for Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, this is kind of... you. You would increase, or the, the, the trade would be that uh, SSA, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, goes into negotiations with relatively weak uh, climate policies that would induce only uh, small costs, whereas um, OECD countries would need to go in with a stronger commitment. And then they would start to trade and uh, say, hey, 
SSA, if you commit to more emission reductions, uh, we give you money. Uh, so I think, and uh, that would be a Pareto improvement for all. Yeah, because the global costs go down and the uh, regional costs all um, are uh, uh, equal to the global, yeah, because they're equal uh, across all the regions. So that is, that is a Pareto improvement. Um, what you would have is in contracts, in uh, agreements, something like um, enforcement mechanisms. Uh, you would need something for compliance. And that is then the difficult part for SSA to accept so that they need to do more under the rules governed by this international um, thing called UNFCCC. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, ah, yeah, I mean, not very much just saying that it was uh, re related to the carbon budget but uh, in terms of the, the quantity. But maybe just two, two or two for, for the question, if you, if I may, one, one is uh, from Caroline Fischer about the uh, subnational inequality, as, as Ulrike mentioned um, in her talk, that for instance, especially of course, for big countries like China, um, you have huge discrepancies across populations. So is there any way to, to address this kind of, this kind of uh, burden? according to different subpopulations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, an alt, uh, another question by Mostafa Afari is about the social cost of carbon, whether it's included in the analysis. As I understand, maybe not, but I mean, also uh, raising the point that impacts and uh, then of course the evaluation with discounting and uh, such as the SEC might matter, or if that's planned to be included. Okay, thank you very much. Both very important questions uh, to Carolyn. This is a very excellent question and we have a paper accepted on that. <laughs> uh, it is not out yet, but uh, it's coming out soon. Uh, basically, we in that paper, we treat uh, the intra-country inequality as a kind of a problem of the country. Yeah, so the, and the big question is, does maintaining the intra-country inequality, so to say, overstretch the uh, carbon uh, tax, carbon pricing revenue. Would the internal carbon pricing revenue be enough to prevent uh, the negative distributional effects? Uh, the question is, uh, the answer to the question is mostly, but not everywhere. And that would be kind of a argument for international transfers in order to prevent these countries from suffering uh, from um, increased inequality. The social cost of carbon question, also very good. Uh, this is future research we have not included in here and that would move us closer to the uh, um, heel Chichilniski literature. Uh, one little thing, um, when you look into the slides, you see, I, I forgot to mention it. I wanted to mention it, but I, I forgot it. So in the uniform carbon pricing scheme in 2030, we would have a carbon a marginal carbon price in all the regions of, I think, $56 per ton of CO2. In the fully differentiated carbon pricing scheme, this increases as a weighted average uh, to 220, I think. So in the totally differentiated carbon pricing case, if you would now like to strengthen the carbon budget by one ton, the global additional cost would be $220 per ton of CO2. In the case of an institutional international agreement with uniform carbon pricing, tightening the um, carbon budget by one ton would only be 56. So this is a re kind of a reinterpretation of um, the weighted average. Yeah, if you would like to maintain 
the institutional structure of the differentiated carbon pricing regime, then every ton of strengthening or the next ton to strengthen the carbon budget would be um, yeah, four times uh, that of the case of uniform carbon pricing. So it makes the global effort much more uh, uh, severe to uh, um, negotiate tighter carbon budgets. Yeah, the uniform carbon pricing cases, they are much better. Yeah, it's only a quarter. Yeah, that, that, that's quite something. And that also plays into the question with the social cost of carbon. Yeah, how much climate change then would be optimal? And the uniform carbon pricing scheme has the uh, ha has on the margin a huge difference. Um, and that uh, is probably going to be very uh, important when we include the social cost of carbon also. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I think we are two minutes over time, um, but it shows the great interest and importance of this topic also. Um, yeah, so I, um, I think uh, Nico is also very accessible, so in case you can send him an email, uh, easily uh, findable on the internet. Um, if you have further questions, sorry, we cannot go through all of them, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I would like to, to thank Nico, especially for, for being, uh, having accepted to give this talk here. Uh, very interesting. And thanks also to Ulrike for, for sharing her, her point and, and research on these important topics. And as said before, uh, there's another webinar on the 25th of February. And if you're uh, interested, check out our website or the one of Navigate uh, Horizon 2020 project. Uh, thanks everyone. And uh, I wish everyone a nice day and uh, hopefully see you soon. Yeah. Thank you, Johannes, and thank you, Ulrike. And thank thank you, Ulrike. Thanks, and, uh, everyone. Good Otavia thanks. and uh, Laura for organizing all the things in the background. Thank you very yes. much for that. Bye.